Hi, folks. How's everyone doing today? Woo, great. Yeah, woo. We're all at SR Econ. All right, get pumped. Here to talk about why we have to love our jobs. It's great. So, who am I? I'm, I'm human. I got a name, got a Twitter handle. Uh, I also have a job and a job I place, place I work at. And I think I'm an expert in loving your job. So when I was making this talk, I was really inspired by this quote. Choose a job you'll love and you will never have to work a day in your life. And you know the great philosopher that said that? Someone who's never ever had a job. This talk is actually, you don't have to love your job. I'm still Leslie, I'm still an engineering manager at Quip, and this is Quip the documents company, not Quip the toothbrush, in case for any of you have heard them on podcasts. And I'm not exactly an expert in loving my job, but I have had a lot of jobs from anywhere from, ooh, anywhere from uh, dongles messing up, and uh, which brings me to my jobs in tech support, uh, working at delis and other things like that, all the way to becoming an engineering manager. So today, I'm gonna take you through the history of this, you know, the modern work ethic, why it hurts you as an employee, and also why it hurts companies. So first, let us go back in time to the Protestant Revolution. That's right, we're at SREcon, we're here to have a world history lesson. So in the 1500s in Europe, uh, the Catholic Church really ruled most aspects of everybody's life. Uh, Martin Luther, seen here, was a German monk, and in 1517, he was upset with what he saw as corruption and hypocrisy in the Catholic Church, and he posted the 95 Theses on the door of the Castle Church in Germany. These uh, reprinted thanks to the relatively new invention of the Gutenberg printing press, were translated from Latin into local languages, and his ideas spread rapidly for the time. You know, there was no Twitter back then. Now, this brings us to John Calvin. John Calvin was a French theologist and minister in Geneva, and he was only eight years old when Luther posted the theses, but as I said before, social change and information spread was much slower back then, so the Reformation was really going strong throughout the entire 16th century. John Calvin uh, formed a branch of this new reform movement called either the Reformers or the Calvinists. So what sets this apart from the Catholic Church? The Calvinists have this idea of predestination. It's basically, no matter what you do, nothing, nothing will change the fact if you're going to heaven or hell, and if you are a good person or a bad person. God has already decided this before you're even born. So this isn't exactly a great sell amongst a lot of people, right? In the previous times in Catholic days, how do you show you're a good person? Well, you uh, go to church, you perform the sacraments, and most importantly, you do good works. Doing these good works shows you're a good person and you get into heaven. So the Calvinists sort of transformed this idea. They had this idea that being successful at work was good, and that's how you showed that God was looking favorably upon you, you were a good person. So yeah, the good works to suddenly work is good and work is being a higher calling because this shows how you are good. So how does 16th century Europe relate to the country that we're all in right now, known as the United States of America? Well, there are two Calvinist groups that had a very big influence, the Pilgrims and the Puritans. This is my favorite pilgrim. So now let's fast forward to the year 1904. Max Weber is a German sociologist and economist, and he wrote this book, which translates into the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. He argued in this book that uh, the Calvinist work ethic had actually become detached from its religious upbringings, and now was an intrinsic part of modern day capitalism. Uh, he thought that this Calvinist work ethic uh, and these ideals is what even made modern day capitalism possible. Uh, 
he also, in a little more depressing of an idea, had the idea of the iron cage, which was an idea that all workers are a cog in the machine, and really no matter what you do, the machine of capitalism will roll over all the workers. It's, you know, some good, some bads. So, in the US, we're in a capitalist society and companies are here to make money. And as many people like myself love to do in talks, I'm gonna define you know, what a company is so we all are on the same page. So there's two basic inputs of a business, right? There's capital or money and labor or people. So you take the capital to usually buy some sort of raw good and then the people or labor uh, transform that into a good or service which you then sell for money, capital, to pay the labor and the cycle continues so on and so forth. Even if you're working for a nonprofit and your business has other goals like that, you need to make money because it costs money to pay rent, uh, eat food, and come to cool conferences like this, right? So, what is love? <laughs> All right, I mean, I'm sure many of you have ever been to an American wedding, so you've probably seen this quote. I'm not gonna read it all aloud to you because we're not at a wedding right now. Um, but look at this. Does this quote really describe a business to you? <laughs> right? No, like, it keeps no record of wrongs. We're at SRECon. Like, what's a postmortem? <laughs> it's a record of wrongs, right? And patient? Have you ever known any manager to be patient? Like, no. This was due yesterday. I want it shipped now. Right? The, so this idea of love and work, I think, just don't go together. Now, this idea also hurts all of us as employees, right? So there's a very famous boss who tweets a lot, Elon Musk. <laughs> hey, if you're that vocal, you're a little easier to pick on. So, you know, he tweeted this about Tesla. There's way easier places to work, but no one ever changed the world on 40 hours a week. And he gives big interviews like this, interview with Kara Swisher, where he brags about working 120 hours a week. That's over 17 hours a day, working seven days a week. That doesn't give you time to sleep and eat and go to the bathroom even. I mean, come on, this is crazy, right? So, but people like this try to encourage you to work these super long hours. And why is that? Money. So let's think about it. You know, we're all engineers here. One of you is working super hard. You're working 80 hours weeks, right? And let's say you got a thousand shares of stock in your stock grant. Not bad, Tesla's doing pretty great. It's a lot of money. So you work really hard, your feature is successful, it sells more cars, cool. Tesla's stock just went up $1 a share. You got a thousand bucks, not bad. Uh, I like a thousand dollars, so I'll be out there afterwards. You all can come give it to me. But Elon Musk owns 33.7 million, million shares of Tesla. So he just would have made $33.7 million. He has a large financial incentive into honestly tricking people into spending all of their time and effort on his work. And we've all had those occasional crunch times, right? Like there's some big launch, your page in the middle of the night. Those are okay and normal in our industry but continuous sustained 80 hour work weeks should never be. And there's been a lot of research into this too, right? Uh, for white collar jobs, which all of us SREs are, uh, working 60 hours or more a week actually shows that you tend to have a 25% decrease in productivity over people who are working 40 hours a week. And that's not per hour, that's period. So you're actually gonna be less successful you're gonna have increased cardiovascular risks, uh, very increased relationship problems and divorce rates. The list goes on and on. And let alone not having time for all the fun things in life, like dressing up kittens in pilgrim outfits. <laughs> also, is it true that you can't change the world on 40 hours a week? Here's Charles Darwin's schedule, right? He did a lot of stuff, but if you look at that left-hand side, you know, he only worked about three hours every day. 
right? All this other stuff is resting, walking, reading books. It's a pretty great schedule. And I don't think anyone can argue that Charles Darwin was lazy, unproductive, and that his ideas weren't revolutionary in changing the world. So you say, that's, that's great, Leslie, but you know, I own a company and psh, I want to smite my lazy workers. <laughs> One of my favorite Soviet propaganda posters, right? <laughs> yeah, so you're like, cool, hey, look, I, I don't care. I want my people to work as hard as possible. Yeah. Well, the thing is, love inspires heroics. And what's one thing that we have been working really hard to get rid of in the SRE industry? This idea of heroics and personal sacrifice, right? I don't want anyone staying up all night, all week to fix pages. I want them to look at a way that we can use automation and process change to fix the underlying problems. When you have this hero love complex, you often aren't looking for these ways to change these. Also, most businesses are really in a long game, right? Sure, I could maybe get a bunch of people to work that hard for 10 months, but I want my business to survive for 10 years, not just 10 months. We, everyone here, like, is anyone here not hiring? Right? We all know how difficult it is to hire people. I don't want good people to be burning out. And also, you rely on that one hero, Wonder Woman's gonna get a new job. She's gonna be like, screw you, I'm gonna star in big budget movies and kick butt. I'm not, I'm not gonna work doing SRE for your company anymore. You don't want that. And you also can push away really good people. There's a, there's a lot of good people who I've talked to, especially since I started talking about how I'm gonna be giving this talk, who said, you know, I, I was honestly considering leaving the tech industry. I don't love it. And I'm like, that's, that's really sad. You're good at your job. You, like, that is, that's what's important. So, also, let's talk about dream jobs, right? Uh, you may be able to tell I love cats. And so, when I think, what's my dream job, this magical idea of a dream job, I think cat cafe, right? I get to sit around, drink coffee and tea, pet cats all day. Like, that, that just sounds wonderful to me. But let's really step back and think about it. What's the probably single most important job at a cat cafe? It's scooping the litter boxes. You're gonna have a cafe for like two hours if you're not cleaning that up because no one is going to go in there, right? So it doesn't matter how much I love cats, the most important job and the job we need to celebrate is scooping the poop. And also, it's really a really privileged place to be in, to say that, you know, if you don't love your job, it's maybe you're not working hard enough, you haven't tried to search for the right job, right? That's, that's not nice, that's, that's pretty sucky. But this all might sound a little bit depressing, but don't worry, there's a lot to celebrate here, right? First off, look, this is a wonderful Alexander McQueen fashion show. But only one person gets to be Alexander McQueen. Let's think of all of the hundreds of people's work who went into making this happen, right? Like, this show wouldn't exist if there wasn't someone working in a factory making spray paint, right? Also, we get to work with some pretty cool people, right? Like, we're working with really smart people thinking of new ways to apply different technologies. And in what other industry do college dropouts like myself get to share stages with PhDs? And let's be honest here, the perks, right? Yeah, a lot of us work in some pretty sweet offices with great perks. Does anyone know a percentage of LaCroix's revenues from tech? Because if you do, come find me outside. I'm, I'm really curious. So you know what? Don't feel guilty like this puppy. Enjoy this awesome space we're in, right? Think about what enjoyment you do get out of your job. And don't love your job. Just be friends. Just like it. Leslie Carr, I work for Quip, and we're hiring, and it's okay. <laughs> <laughs>